Welcome to this video, which describes models of pediatric palliative care and will focus on hospital-based programs. My name is Dr. Megan Doherty, and I'm a pediatric palliative care specialist in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. The objectives for this session is that after the session, you will be able to describe how pediatric palliative care can be provided in hospitals, and you'll understand the key considerations and challenges of this approach. It's important that we first consider how palliative care can be provided. We often think of palliative care as just the top portion of this pyramid, meaning the care provided by specialists in palliative care. But there's also general palliative care, where all staff have training in palliative care and can integrate this with their regular clinical care in the hospital. This means that we listen well to our patients, we communicate effectively with them, their pain and other symptoms are treated effectively, and we focus on the holistic goals and needs of the family. At the bottom of the pyramid is the palliative care approach. This means that trained volunteers and community health workers can provide care for children in their own homes. Hospital-based palliative care services can be developed and delivered in a number of ways. Some of the early steps are often to integrate and provide palliative care services to hospital inpatients, and then to integrate palliative care into outpatient services. Later, you can move towards having dedicated inpatient palliative care beds, which provide more space for families whose child is approaching the end of life. And lastly, palliative care outreach or home care services can be provided if this is possible in your setting. Hospital-based palliative care can be provided in the form of general palliative care. In this way, staff members who have palliative care skills can integrate them into their patient care. This requires training for all staff who are going to integrate general palliative care. This type of general palliative care is best supported by specialist palliative care. In the case of MSF, this will be provided by pediatric palliative care specialists available via telemedicine. The telemedicine service is strongly encouraged for all palliative care cases. This is an added layer of support and guidance that is here to help you. Please consider using the telemedicine service for your first palliative care cases. It will help you develop comfort with this new type of care. And remember, there's no question too small to ask the palliative care consultants on telemedicine. When we think about the minimum palliative care services that need to be provided by a general palliative care approach, we have to consider the following points. We should be able to identify children who could benefit from palliative care. This involves establishing some kind of referral criteria to guide staff, but the criteria can be flexible, recognizing that some patients don't fall into the specific categories. We need to be able to address patients' needs holistically. This means treating their pain and other distressing physical symptoms, as well as recognizing and supporting spiritual, psychological, and social needs. And lastly, we need to be able to provide clear communication about the child's condition and prognosis. We need to explore what matters most to families and use this to determine culturally appropriate goals of care. The World Health Organization provides guidance on general palliative care as well. They have developed a series of planning guides, including the one which we've provided the link here for. In the guides, they provide guidance about the essential practices for primary palliative care. As you can see here, the important considerations include physical care needs for pain, respiratory problems, gastrointestinal problems, delirium, skin issues, insomnia, fatigue, anorexia, anemia, drowsiness, and sweating, as well as support for psychological emotional, and spiritual care needs related to psychological distress, anxiety, suffering, spiritual needs and existential distress, depression, and bereavement support. Additionally, the WHO guide provides guidance about common considerations which require palliative care management in general palliative care, including care, planning, and coordination, and communication issues. When planning and implementing a new hospital-based palliative care service, your team should discuss how you will address each of the items listed here including identify support and resource availability, provide care in the last days and weeks of life, facilitate access to essential medicines, particularly opioids, and identifying the psychosocial and spiritual needs of professionals who are providing care for patients. In terms of common communication issues, these include how to communicate with patients, families, and caregivers about the diagnosis, prognosis, treatment, symptoms, and their management, and issues relating to end-of-life care as well as identifying and setting priorities and providing information and guidance to patients and caregivers according to local available resources. 
When you start to set up a hospital-based program, you should consider the goals for the program. Possible goals which are relatively simple to accomplish include improving pain and symptom management, particularly focused on common symptoms, such as pain, especially procedural pain, dyspnea, nausea and vomiting, and agitation, and providing end-of-life care, which means care in the last hours and days. Palliative care education is an important component of setting up a hospital-based palliative care team. All hospital staff should receive some education about pediatric palliative care. For example, you should educate providers that palliative care is more than end-of-life care and is not only indicated for patients who are dying. Extra training should be provided for staff who are frequently working with children with serious illnesses, such as those in a neonatal intensive care unit. Training should address common myths, such as the myth that palliative care hastens death, and should emphasize that palliative care is about improving quality of life and does not seek to hasten death. Another common myth is that palliative care is only for children who are actively dying, and this needs to be addressed with the reality that palliative care can and should be provided from the time of diagnosis to have the maximum benefit for children. This image shows that idea. The dark blue is the supportive and palliative care, and the disease-modifying treatment is in light blue. In this diagram, as the patient's condition moves from left to right across the image, the amount of palliative and supportive care goes up since the patient's disease is progressing and they move into the end-of-life phase. This also shows how palliative care should be provided from the time of diagnosis to the time of death, as well as during the phase of bereavement. Training for staff at MSF facilities can be requested by asking for general palliative care training for the whole team. Topics for this training would include palliative care for children, which children need palliative care, pain and symptom assessment in children, communication and breaking bad news, and discussions about ethics surrounding discontinuation of treatments which may be futile or are causing a lot of suffering for children. There are several excellent additional training resources, including the e-learning modules on children's palliative care from the International Children's Palliative Care Network which is available from elearnicpcn.org. These modules are free of charge and you get a certificate for completing each module. It's also very helpful to see a palliative care program that's already running and get exposure to actual palliative care patients when you're starting out. Additionally, the WHO guide shows the basic, mid-level and advanced training that doctors and nurses who want to specialize in palliative care should have. As a hospital-based palliative care program grows and expands, there can be some additional goals that occur later on. These goals will require more staff training, a culture change at the hospital, and more resources. They include advanced communication with families, avoiding or discontinuing high-intensity care for children who are not benefiting from these treatments, addressing complex ethical challenges, developing discharge plans and providing home-based care, and providing bereavement supports. Identifying which children can benefit from palliative care in a hospital-based program is an important early step. The surprise question can be helpful for identifying children who would benefit from palliative care services. This question is, would you be surprised if this child died in the next year? If the answer is no, that you would not be surprised, this is a child whom it is appropriate to institute palliative care for. Additionally, these three categories of children often benefit from palliative care. Children living with a progressive condition, which has ongoing deterioration of health or abilities, children living with a life-threatening condition, and children with significant pain or other symptoms which palliative care can address. If we think about neonates who are in hospital, these are some of the common issues that they may have which may indicate a need for palliative care. Severe congenital anomalies, congenital heart disease, gastroschisis, omphalocele, and neural tube defects, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, extreme prematurity, neonatal sepsis or severe infection, and chromosomal disorders, including trisomy 13 and 18. Children in hospital may include those with severe infections, such as sepsis, meningitis, or cerebral malaria, severe burns, particularly for pain control, congenital heart disease, sickle cell disease, and thalassemia, as well as severe brain injuries, including strokes, from cerebral malaria, sickle cell disease, and other causes, and hypoxic and traumatic brain injuries. 
I've placed an asterisk beside severe burns and sickle cell disease and thalassemia, since these children often have significant symptoms and can benefit from palliative care expertise in pain and symptom management, even if the child's treatment goals are curative. This is an example of a hospital-based palliative care approach from Cambodia at a children's hospital. In this program, they identified children who had conditions which may benefit from palliative care approach. And these are listed here, including conditions with a potential cure, such as advanced or progressive cancer, complex and severe congenital heart disease, severe malnutrition, and life-threatening infections. Conditions requiring long-term care that's quite intensive include HIV, cystic fibrosis, renal failure, chronic respiratory failure, muscular dystrophy, and gastrointestinal disorders, thalassemia, and hemophilia. Progressive conditions without cure include progressive metabolic disorders, certain chromosomal abnormalities, and severe forms of osteogenesis imperfecta. And last, there are conditions which are severe and have a non-progressive disability, such as severe cerebral palsy, hypoxic brain injuries, extreme prematurity, and severe brain malformations. In this study, using the proposed criteria, they found that 60% of children admitted to the hospital met one or more of the criteria listed. Interestingly, the average length of stay for these children was 5.6 days, compared with 3.3 for those not meeting the criteria, and the chance of readmission was 8%, compared with 2.6%. In this part of the presentation, we're going to discuss two different cases of children who received palliative care in hospital. The first case is this four-year-old girl with burns. She was brought to the emergency room 10 days after she was burnt. She had 38% body surface area burned with first and second degree burns. She had anemia, systemic infection, and dehydration. She was stabilized and had wound debridement performed. She received two blood transfusions and her hemoglobin was raised to 6.4, but could not be further raised due to lack of blood availability. She was treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics for one month and continued to have nightly fevers which were treated with paracetamol. She was eating well, walking with her parents, but preferred laying in bed on the ward. And the team was wondering, how can we manage this patient? And how could palliative care provide some extra support? And they wanted help with pain management. Here are some of the key palliative care interventions which the pediatric team used to help this patient. Her pain was assessed using the FACES pain scale revised, which is shown here. In this scale, the child is asked to self-report. The child is shown the images and told that the image above zero, the most left image, shows no pain, and the faces show more and more pain, up to the last image on the right, which shows very much pain. Then the child is asked to say how much pain she has by pointing to the corresponding face. Children with burns often have two types of pain. They have procedural pain and they have constant pain. In this case, the child had procedural pain with dressing changes and physiotherapy. The team used oral morphine, 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, and you could also use ketamine at the doses shown here. Note that with ketamine, you may have to titrate to affect as rapid tolerance occurs due to liver metabolism. Additionally, the team used lorazepam at the doses shown to help her relax for procedures. For constant pain, we recommend using the symptom control manual for all dosing guidelines, and we've included it as one of the references here. In the case when the child had mild pain, the team used regular paracetamol. This is if her score on the face's pain scale was 0 or 2. Morphine was used if the face's pain scale score was 4 or above and adjuvants including ketamine, amitriptyline, carbamazepine, and valproic acid could be considered to assist with overall pain management and to treat neuropathic pain.
Other non-pharmacological pain treatments, which could be considered for this child, include relaxation techniques such as deep breathing and guided imagery. For deep breathing, you can coach the patient to slowly take deep breaths or slowly count to 10. Guided imagery helps the child to imagine a place where she feels safe and comfortable so that she can relax. You could say something like this. Try thinking of a time when you felt really comfortable. Imagine that you are there now. What does it look like? What do you feel? What do you hear? Lastly, it's important to consider communication with the child. We need to prepare her for dressing changes by telling her why and what will happen. We need to help her to understand in simple language why she is sick and that she will get better. Children cope better when they understand and have their questions answered. And it's always important and best to provide age-appropriate explanations and to communicate openly with children, as this is the most effective way to reduce their anxiety. Let's look at a second case. This is a six-year-old little girl with facial swelling. She presented to your hospital several months after having an enucleation of her right eye at another hospital. At that time, the family was advised for chemotherapy, but they could not afford to travel to the capital city for the treatment. She now presents with evidence of tumor progression in the right orbit. She has abdominal swelling and she's severely malnourished. Additionally, she has limitation of opening of her mouth with foul breath and contralateral deviation of the tongue and difficulty swallowing. The differential diagnosis is that of advanced cancer, including retinoblastoma or neuroblastoma. And the team feels that it's wise to initiate palliative care due to the incurability of her disease. But they wonder about the benefit of inserting an NG tube. So they request advice from the telemedicine pediatric palliative care specialist. So let's pause and you can write down your ideas. How can palliative care help this child? What is one palliative care intervention that you would want to do for this child at this time? And what do you need to know more about in order to provide palliative care for this child? We'll discuss these cases during our live workshop, but please consider them and come with some ideas. The palliative care advice was as follows. This is an advanced cancer and unfortunately there's no chance of cure. This news needs to be provided to the family in a compassionate way and the team used Spike's method to deliver this news. You can watch the video in this playlist on communication which will give you more information about how to use the Spike's method to deliver bad news. The team decided to focus on quality of life and symptom control given the child's prognosis. In this case, the palliative medicine specialist advised that nutrition support should be focused on comfort and that the child should not have an NG tube for this reason. And in fact, we know that in children with advanced cancer, providing aggressive nutritional rehabilitation or feeding via NG tube does not improve their quality of life. In fact, it makes them more uncomfortable, have more secretions, more abdominal pain and distension, and it doesn't Im increase the duration of life meaning it doesn't allow them to live longer. Once the communication was done with the family about the diagnosis and prognosis, the family wanted to go home so the child could be surrounded by relatives and friends. The team focused on home care planning since the family wanted to go home. First, they had to achieve symptom control in hospital, and then once the symptom control was achieved, they could make a plan for home care. Pain control was achieved with oral morphine, 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram per dose every four hours. In this case, she was given liquid morphine, 2.5 milligrams every four hourly. The team chose to use 10 milligram per mil injectable morphine since this would allow them to use very small volumes, 0.25 mils every four hours, could, which could be given and absorbed through the buccal mucosa. The team chose not to put in an NG tube since the parents would not be able to maintain this at home and the team felt confident after having the palliative care specialist advice that this would neither improve the quality or duration of her life. She did get a course of oral antibiotics and oral antifungals and the parents were taught how to do good mouth care and this improved her mouth's appearance and smell. For further details about home-based palliative care, you can watch the next video in our playlist which details this type of care. This concludes this video on hospital-based palliative care. In summary, hospital-based palliative care can be provided in a general sense by all hospital staff with basic training. The general palliative care of all staff can be supported with a specialist in palliative care via telemedicine. The goals of a hospital-based palliative care program should include identifying children who could benefit from palliative care, treating pain and other distressing physical symptoms, 
recognizing and supporting spiritual, psychological, and social needs, and providing clear communication about the child's condition and prognosis to their family.